have been an inscription, it might have been a written book, it might have been something that uh, was handed down from one generation to another, but there was always some sort of sacred text. Now in the temple model, there was also uh, sacred men. It was always men, it was never women, but it was men who had possession of the sacred text. And those sacred men would tell the sincere followers, here's what you have to do to live your life. And if you don't do it the way that we lay it out for you, God's going to get you. And people would live in fear. And I'll say it again, the temple model was prevalent all around the world. And you still find it in certain places today. But as we saw last week, when Jesus showed up, he launched something brand new. It was a total departure from the temple model. And he established what he called a new arrangement with God. Jesus gave us a new arrangement. You might have heard it referred to as a covenant. There was an old covenant, now there was a new covenant. We're going to use the word arrangement because I think we understand more what that word refers to. Now he also gave us a new principle. He said this new principle, this command that I'm going to give you, is going to take precedence over all the other commands that you've ever heard. In fact, if you can, this is a promise for us. If we can get this one command right, we don't even need all the rest of the commands. That's a big word. And in so doing, he took this new principle that we're going to talk about today, and he said, once this principle gets into your life, it's going to start trickling down into every relationship you have. And he said, the end result of that is that you're going to call together other people who believe what you believe, and you're going to make a difference. And he called it a new movement. And Jesus said to the people, he says, I am going to build a new gathering. He said, I'm going to build a new congregation. I'm going to build, an, and the literal word in scripture is, I'm going to build an ecclesia. Most of our Bibles said, I'm going to build my church, which is an unfortunate word. And we're going to talk about that uh, a little bit tonight. Uh, we kind of took a German word and forced it into the English text. And that's where we got the word church from. Uh, and we're not going to change it after all these years. We're going to use the word church, okay? Okay. It's not a bad word. Okay, it is a bad word in some places. I know you, some of you grew up with churches like that. But Jesus said, I am going to bring something brand new out, and it's going to change the way that you do your lives. So let's talk about this temple model for just a moment. A couple of things we need to know. First of all, the temple model was impossible to live up to. The temple model, the example that everything that we just talked about, sacred men, sacred places, sacred texts, sincere followers, it was impossible for the people to live up to that. And then here comes Jesus, and Jesus raises the standard so high that no one could meet it. You say, well, that's not fair. Well, it wouldn't be fair except for the fact that then Jesus offered himself as the sacrifice for the sins of the entire world. Now this temple model required people to go to their temple to make peace with God. Jesus said, you're used to doing that, aren't you? You're used to going to the temple. He says, you can forget that now. He says, from now on, I want you to go and make peace with your neighbor. God can wait until you make peace with your neighbor. Do you remember the conversation he has with his disciples? He said, if you're on your way to give an offering, and you remember that you've got something against a brother, or they've got something against you, what did he say? Leave your offering there, and go make peace with your brother or your sister. Then you can come back and make your offering to God. Jesus is laying the foundation for what he was talking about. Now what was very interesting is that the temple model, as you look through history, was nation specific. Each nation did it their own way. You can talk about the different nations and religions in the world and each had their own place and they had their own God or gods. And Jesus came and said, hey, what I'm introducing, it's for everybody. This is for all nations. And this is not about sacred places. He said, when, when you are standing 
on what you think is the most sacred space on the entire planet. He said, I want you to look around because the person to your right and the person to your left is more sacred than the ground on which you're standing. So Jesus launched something completely new. And in the early days when he did this, the Gentiles flocked to this new message because they were tired of following a paganism that never worked. And many Jewish people in and around Judea began to flock to this Jesus movement. You do know that all of Jesus's original followers were Jews. But the Jewish Christians in that first century, they had a little more trouble than some with this whole problem. There was a very specific tension that they had to manage that made it difficult for them to completely give up the old ways and totally embrace this new thing called the Jesus movement. It just didn't seem right to them to give up their customs and their traditions. Can we all admit old ways die hard? Yeah, and you know, we all think we're just kind of those people, we don't have any problem with that. You wait, the older you get, the harder it's gonna be for you to accept some of the changes that those youngsters are gonna bring into our lives, amen? amen. Yeah, not a women, just amen. Just gonna make sure that you got that there, okay? But for these Jews, it really felt disrespectful for them to abandon everything that they'd been brought up with. And that brings us to a very important point that we're gonna explore next week. So please don't miss next week. I'm gonna say that probably half a dozen more times. You've got to be here next week because of what we're gonna talk about. But let me go ahead and give you this truth. Go ahead and put it up here if you would, my next one. Our consciences determine our religious reality. Write that down so that you can take that home and think about it. We're not gonna talk about it much tonight. This will be next week. Your conscience determines your religious reality, whether it is a reality or not. What you think about what you do, the conviction you have about what you do, determines what you really follow. And I know I'm, you, you kind of think, you know, let, let me get it this way. Whatever is religious for you, whatever you experience as being religious, it is your conscience that determines this, whether or not what you're doing is actually a spiritual reality. Now, we've all struggled with this. Have you ever had anybody say to you after you've done something, you know what, you really shouldn't feel guilty about that. Now, the fact that they told you that you shouldn't feel guilty about that, did that take your guilt away? No. Why? Because our conscience has been fine-tuned to a set of values. Every one of us have those values. And some of those values in time become religion. It's just how we do it because that's what we've always done. Now, at times, you're going to be with your friends and they're going to do things that bother you. But it doesn't seem to bother them, does it? And they're good people, but it doesn't bother them. Or you're going to do things that bother other people. Why is that? Well, it's because, again, our consciences are fine-tuned to a certain set of values that oftentimes we will use at some point to define as religion. Now, I'm, I'm going to go there tonight. So those of you that grew up in the Catholic Church, will you grant me pardon and forgiveness now? Okay, yeah, somebody back there just crossed themselves. Thank you so much. As a lot of you know, I grew up in a very conservative church. And I had a lot of Catholic friends. And I just honestly didn't get my Catholic friends. Um, one of the things was they had to go to confession. And so I would speak to my friends and I would say, you know what, you don't have to go to confession. You can just tell God that you're sorry and move on. And they were like, oh, no, 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 no. I have to go to confession. And I'm like, whatever. Okay, I was real sensitive in those days. Stay with me. But I'll tell you what, their conscience dictated that they go to confession. In their minds, they simply could not imagine not going to Mass and not going to confession. Now, meanwhile, the church I grew up in, we didn't drink any alcohol. Zero. Not even our communion. 
we made sure we had Welch's. We had the good stuff, you know? Welch's, Welch's yeah. grape juice, yeah. right? Yeah. I got it. And, and so, you know, we would have this conversation and they would say, you, you, you don't drink any alcohol? And I would say, no, we don't drink alcohol. And they were like, well, we drink alcohol in church. <laughs> and I'm going, what? You drink alcohol in church? Really? And they're like, why don't you drink? And we were like, what? Because you're not supposed to. Is that it? Well, yeah, isn't that enough? You know, uh, you know, well, and then they would throw back at us, well, Jesus turned water into wine, and our comeback to that was, yeah, but we're not really sure that it was real wine. <laughs> Some of you have been around these arguments and all these things for years. Yes, it was real wine. We know that because of the words that are used. But really, all those arguments that I just had with my Catholic friends, it all came down to tradition. Mm -hmm. And the way that we were raised and the way religion was presented to us, it fine tunes our conscience. And that's why I think the next couple of weeks are going to be very difficult for some of us. Please don't miss these next two weeks. So what was happening in the early church, and, and go ahead and put this up on the screen. The early Jewish Christians tried to blend Jesus into the temple model. You know, we talked about the temple model, the sacred places, sacred people, sacred texts, sincere followers, okay? What they tried to do was they tried to take Jesus and make him a part of the temple system, the temple model. Now remember, they were Jews, right? Was Jesus a Jew? Yes, in case you didn't know that. Jesus was Jewish. He was the Messiah. He was an extension of the Old Testament, at least the way they saw it. So they hung on to all of their Old Testament thinking, and they just wanted to blend Jesus' talk and Jesus' teaching into the temple model. Then, from a historical perspective, then... I just want to go, then along came Jones. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah. You guys know that song? You don't know that song, do you? Remind me to share that one with you. Um, then along came the Apostle Paul to the church's rescue. Paul steps onto the pages of history as Saul of Tarsus. When we first meet him, he goes by the name Saul. And when we first meet him in Scripture, he is not a Christian. In fact, he was a Pharisee. And he claimed to be the best Pharisee there was. He claimed that he could out Pharisee the Pharisees. And when he found out about Christianity, and he found out about this Jesus movement, he set out single-handedly to destroy the church. He didn't believe any of it. He thought it was all terrible. Well, God got his attention as he was on his way to a place called Damascus. And Saul of Tarsus becomes a Jesus follower and joins the Jesus movement. And Saul, who now becomes known as Paul, knows better than anybody else that this Jesus thing, it's completely new. So he began to teach that. This is a former Jewish leader. He's going, hey, this thing Jesus brought, it is brand new. This is not an add-on. Jesus showed us how to do something different. But Paul understood better than most how dangerous it would be to try to blend the temple model with following Jesus. So on his first missionary journey, he goes to an area called Galatia. It's, uh, it was a Roman province then. Uh, in today's terminology, it would be in modern day Turkey. So we're going to go to Galatians chapter 5, and we're going to start in verse 1 in just a couple of minutes. But Paul goes to these people in Galatia, and he plants little Jesus gatherings. Okay, I'm not going to use the word church because he wouldn't have used the word church. He was planting little Jesus movements, and he teaches them. And some of the Jewish people embrace Jesus, and some of the Gentile people embrace Jesus, and, and they're starting to get along together really well. And so Paul leaves a functioning church, and then he goes on to another town to do the very same thing. But behind him comes another set of missionaries. These were Jewish Christians. And here's what they would say to the Christians in Galatia, after Paul had already left, they would say, hey, everybody, Paul is a wonderful man. 
Paul is a great evangelist, but Paul didn't tell you everything you needed to know. If you're going to become a Jesus follower, you must first become a Jew. After all, Jesus is Jewish. And Jesus is the Messiah, and Jesus is an extension of the Old Testament. So if you're going to follow Jesus, then you've got to become Jewish first. Now next week, I'm going to teach you how. I'm going to give you some of the specifics about how the temple model has invaded what we do. Our version of Christianity, so you don't want to miss that. But here's what I want to do for the next few minutes. I want to show you the incredible emotion, anger, and passion that the Apostle Paul had around the idea of mixing these two things, the Jesus movement and the, the temple model. And we're going to discover just what a big deal this really is. All right? Now, let me just, a couple more things here real quick. Paul talks about a group called Judaizers. Don't know if that's a new word for you or not, but Judaizers were Jewish Christians. They accepted Jesus, who believed that Gentiles had to become Jews in order to follow Jesus. They were called Judaizers. You got the idea? They had to. You had to become a Jew if you were going to become a Christian. Now, these people were Christians. They were Jesus followers, but again, they just believed that Jesus was an extension of the Old Testament. So again, if you're going to become a Jew, uh, if you're going to become a, G a Jesus follower, you've got to become a Jew first, which was very complicated for Gentiles. And for men, it required a little surgery. Uh-oh. The Judaizers would come along and they would say, hey, everybody, Jesus died for you, so you can have a little surgery for him. That was their message. Now, when the Apostle Paul found out that that's what these other teachers were doing and they were undermining the purity of the Jesus movement, he became, and I've got, this is your Reader's Digest word for the month. He became, are you ready? Put it up there. Apoplectic. Have you come, come across that word before? Apoplectic? This is cool. It means extremely angry. Extremely, which I think is so cool because what is right in the middle of apoplectic? Pop! He is about ready to pop! He's that mad! And everybody else would be like, Paul, what's the big deal here? And he's going to say, i got to tell you why this is such a big deal. Because if you don't understand that the Jesus thing we're talking about is a complete departure from the temple model, he says you're going to dilute it, you're going to pollute it, and you're going to lead people down the wrong path. This was a big deal to the Apostle Paul. So I want to walk us through Galatians chapter 5, and I want you to experience the intensity because I want you to understand why this should be such a big deal to those of us here at the crosswalk. Are you ready? Galatians 5, verse 1. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free, right? So if your version of Christianity doesn't make you feel free, you're doing it wrong. Okay? Don't miss next week. Stand firm then and don't let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. He's talking about this thinking you got to be a Jew. He's saying that's like a, a yoke that would be put on an animal. He, he, verse 2, mark my words. Now what's interesting is the, the Greek language has no punctuation in it. But you can write something with such strong words that the translators will say, we gotta put an exclamation point there. And the way this is written in Greek, this is powerful. It's like, mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. He's saying, now, Paul had no problem with circumcision, okay? We'll talk about that in a minute. But what was happening here is people were, the, the men, were getting circumcised so that they could be known as a Jesus follower. And he was saying, if you let yourself be circumcised for that reason, Christ is of no value to you. Now, I, I need to explain the circumcision thing. Thank you again for not having too many of your children in here today. Um, again, Paul was not against the procedure of circumcision. Paul was a Jew. He was circumcised. All of Jesus' original followers were circumcised. And there's no easy way to teach this. 
Again, Paul was not against the procedure of circumcision. He would take your child in. Jesus was circumcised on the seventh or eighth day. And Paul was not against that. Uh, in the context of circumcision, in the context of the Bible, that was an Old Testament thing. It represented the Old Covenant. Last week we learned that Jesus launched a new covenant, a new arrangement. So this is a total departure. This is completely different. So Paul is going, wait, 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 wait. Because remember, he's talking to Gentile men. He's not talking to moms and babies. He's saying, if you allow yourself to be circumcised, you are embracing the old covenant. You don't need to be circumcised for a religious purpose. That was a sign that the nation of Israel belonged in a unique way to God. And that's not what we're talking about, okay? So he says, if you were circumcised as an adult, then Christ is of no value to you. You've abandoned the new to embrace the old. Verse 3. He says, again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. Was that what you were signing up for when you got baptized? When you got baptized, did you agree that you were going to keep all 630 of the commands that the Jewish people believe are in the Old Testament, plus the Ten Commandments themselves? Do you even have a list of those? I mean, how are you going to know whether or not you're keeping them unless you've got a list of them? But that's not what we're talking about here. This is a big deal. These people were trying to blend all of this stuff together. Hey, let's have a little bit of the Old Testament. Let's have a little bit of the temple thinking. We'll throw in a little bit of Jesus with that, and everybody will be happy, right? And Paul goes, wait! If you think that all you've got to do is be circumcised, and then suddenly you're going to get all these advantages of the Old Covenant and the advantages of God, you're wrong. He says, if you do this, you better be prepared to keep every single rule and every single law. Don't kid yourself. He says, you're either all in or you're not in at all. You see, God has launched something brand new and circumcision is of no value anymore as it relates to some kind of special relationship with God. Verse four, you who are trying to be justified. What does the word justified mean? You're trying to get it right with God, okay? You're trying to get in right with God. You're justified with God, trying to make things right. He says, you who are trying to be justified by the law, which would be circumcision, have been alienated. He's talking to people who thought they were Christians, Gentile Christians. He says, you've been alienated from Christ. And they're like, no, we haven't. We're just trying to be good little boys and girls and take a little bit of this and a little bit of that and blend it all together. And look what Jesus, what, look what Paul says next. You have fallen away from grace. Oh, those are words I don't really like to have to read. You have fallen away from grace. What is it that put them in that position? They're trying to mix everything together. Do we have people in our world today that are trying to mix this religion and this religion and a little bit of that and hey, let's not upset anybody and let's bring it all together and we'll do it like that. Listen, if you haven't, if you're not with me yet, let me try this illustration and, and we'll see if this works. Let's say that after the service tonight, you come up to me and you say, David, we so appreciate this church and what it's doing for our kids and our marriage and we wanted to get you and I'll leave something. I'm not going to tell you which restaurant I prefer, but I'm just kind of throwing that out. So you give me a gift card for $100. And I say to you, I am so grateful. Thank you so much. But I can't let you do that. Let me pay you for this. And you're going, no, 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 no. It's a gift. And I say, well, what if I give you 50 bucks? And you go, no, 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 it's a gift. And I say, okay, what if I give you 25 bucks? And I wear you down and you go, okay, I'll let you give me $25 for a $100 gift card. At that point, it is no longer a gift card. It is a discount card. It's a discount card. Right? right? Because I just took the gift out of the card. Here's what Paul is saying. He's saying grace is the hallmark of the Christian experience. 
Grace means God knew everything about you and chose to love you anyway. Grace means you don't deserve it. Grace is grace. And the moment that you start trying to earn it, the moment you think you can have surgery and put yourself in good standing, the moment you think if you keep a few certain laws or anything else you want to try to do, he says the moment you do that, you've done away with grace. Grace is a gift. Grace is at the heart, by the way, of the cross walk. Paul says the moment you think you've offered God something so good, that God says, wow, I never noticed how good you were before. You come on in, you're one of my favorites. He says, the moment you do that, you have fallen away from grace. And it's like, this is extreme, isn't it? This is hard. But I, I gotta tell you, Paul hasn't even gotten to the extreme part yet. Hold on, verse six. He says, for in Christ Jesus, this would be, in the, if you're in the Jesus movement, Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. Let's stop right there. Paul goes, hey, everybody, I'm a Jew. I was circumcised on the eighth day, but it doesn't do me any good anymore. That's not why God loves me. And he's speaking to these people and he says, you're Gentiles and you weren't circumcised. And it doesn't matter either because all of that is done away with. He's saying there's something new here. And then he says something that is so extreme. My guess is that most of you don't even know this is in the Bible. If you're not a church person, please listen. Because my hunch is what he is about to say addresses the reason why you have resisted the church or resisted Christians in particular. Because as we talked about last week, there is so much about us that is resistible, isn't there? Uh, and when we said... Here, well, go ahead and put it up there. Most of what I, what I said last week, most of what people resist about church, the church, did I goof? Okay, I want, did I not put that in there between verses 6a and 6b? Is it up there? I don't have it. Okay, what I told you last week was that most of what people resist about the church, the church should resist about itself. I said that, okay? So this is coming from the Apostle Paul, who, by the way, wrote over half the New Testament. And the reason you're a Christian, if you're a Gentile like me, I don't have a Jewish background. The reason I'm a Christian is primarily because of the work Paul did. So I want you to listen to what this ex-Pharisee who used to hate the Jesus movement had to say. Second half of verse 6. The only thing that counts. Do you understand what those words mean? The only thing that counts. How many things count? One thing. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Is this it? That's the only thing that counts. And I'm sure there are people, Paul, do you see how thick the Bible is? Are you telling me there's really only one thing that counts? You probably mean that there are 10 things that count and um, you're giving us one of them, right? And, and Jesus would say, no, 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 no. And then they would say, but Jesus, there are 10 commandments. Yeah, but forget all of that. But there's like 630 rules. And Jesus would say, I know. But Jesus would say, the only thing that counts. Paul, how many things count? One thing counts. The only thing that counts is faith expressing, which is another way of saying working it out. We're working it out, okay? We're working out our faith. The only thing that counts, the only thing that matters is our faith expressing itself through love. When you look at circumcision and all that it represented to these people, circumcision and the whole temple model go like this. God, how am I doing? God, I just got circumcised. How am I doing? God, oh yeah, I did a bad thing over there the other day. Could you please forgive me of that? God, how am I doing? Huh? How am I doing, God? Am I doing okay, God? What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? That's a vertical relationship, right? Paul says that day is over. If you're a Christian, if you believe Jesus is the Son of God, if you believe that He died for your sins, Paul says, you're in. Wow, that 
that was something, wasn't it? Did we do any vertical thing there? You know, I, I believe. And, and now Paul is going to say, you know what? Quit worrying about what God thinks of you. Quit worrying. If you believe God sent his son into this world and he died for your sins, if you believe that, guess what? You're in. Now listen, if somebody will die for you, they're for you. Mm -hmm. You never have to wonder how you and God are doing again, okay? So Paul would say, quit looking up and start looking around. Because the only thing of value is how you treat other people. Not how you treat God, God's fine. And this is a really big deal. Because if our whole approach to God is, God, are we good? God, are we good? God, are we good? Paul says, that day's over. Put a bow on it, put it in the back of the closet. It was valuable. It got us to where we are today, but that's history. He goes on in verse 7. And you ever use words in ways that you just kind of... You guys don't ever do this, okay? <laughs> verse 7. You were running a good race. Okay? He's using the analogy of race. And he says, you were doing great when I was with you. I was explaining all this. And then he uses a little wordplay. And I, I'm not trying to be too graphic, but use your imagination a little bit. He says, you were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? Anybody else see the kind of little funny there that he did on purpose? You know, who cut in on you? You're with me? Okay, verse 9, he says something that we can identify with. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. A little bit of yeast. A little bit of a single cell fungus. You know that's what yeast is. Single cell fungus. You take just a pinch and you put it into this dense, gooey, gooey dough. A little bit of yeast. Come back later and what's happened? The whole thing has changed. So he's saying, you know what, if you take a little bit of the temple model and a little bit of legalism and a little bit of gracelessness and a little bit of, hey, God, how am I doing? He says, you're going to pollute the whole thing. His point is, it only takes a small dose of the wrong thing to correct, to corrupt the whole thing. And Paul's telling us again, what Jesus brought is brand new. Paul's getting emotional about this. He's got a lot of emotion. And I'm sure somebody tried to get him to calm down. You know, they probably said, let's just all hold hands and sing Kumbaya. And we're all different kinds of Christians. And some people are more traditional and some people are more this way. And Paul says, no. He says, you don't understand. Because Paul knew where this was going to lead. Because it's led to where many churches have gone today. And here is the R-rated part of the message. The part that shows how apoplectic he becomes over this issue of blending the old with the new. Are you ready? Verse 12. As for those agitators, the people who came in behind him and polluted the message, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. He's saying, if you're going to start cutting, cut it off. That is, in essence, what he says. And you're, you're shocked, and I'm going, do you read your Bible? There's stuff like this all over the Bible. It's in there. It's really interesting because the word that's there is apokopto. The Greek word, apokopto. It just means cut it off. And they're going, Paul, you're so extreme. And Paul says, you don't understand what's at stake. How would he know? Well, he had been front and center in the temple model all of his life. He was part of the they in the temple model. And he knows anytime you start blending things, you're not going to end up with a 50-50 blend. You're not going to end up with an 80-20 blend. You're not even going to end up with 90-10. You're going to end up with 99% the stuff you don't like and 1% the stuff that you do. And this is what's killing churches today. Paul says that's how big of a deal it is. Because here's what he knew. Let me give you just a couple of things and we'll start wrapping this up. Paul knew that leaders would become self-righteous. This is what's going to happen if we try to blend all this together. Leaders are going to become self-righteous because that's what always happens in the, in the temple model. Leader, leaders become self-righteous because they're the ones who get to interpret the text in a way that always makes them look good. 
And, you know, the way that it happened in the old days is they would take the rules and, and misapply them. And he would say, they would say to the people, well, good luck to you. I'm so sorry it didn't work out for you. You just weren't quite good enough. So you just go around trying to be like me. In the temple model, leaders always become self-righteous, which makes, secondly, followers become hypocrites. So if you're going to follow this way, the followers are going to become hypocrites. And what you have to do for that to happen is you've got to dumb down the rules. Have you ever been in a place where you've got to dumb down the rules so that people understand what you're trying to get across? We do that with God's law all the time. Oh, God didn't really mean that, did he? I can't believe that God would do that. We have to dumb, that, dumb it down so it doesn't bother our conscience. See, when Jesus showed up, he raised the standard so high that nobody could keep the standard. Why did he do that? To show us how much we needed him. But with the temple model, we bring the rules down. And the leaders become self-righteous and the followers become hypocrites. And Paul knew this. And Paul next knew that the text would be manipulated. We would take the scriptures and we would twist them around. And the ultimate in all this, he knew that the people would be mistreated. Don't raise your hand for this question, but have you ever been mistreated by a church? Have you ever had somebody put rules higher than love? Oh, you mean that thing, that the only thing that is of value, the only thing that really matters? Somebody would make rules that were more important than love? Paul knew if we held on to the old things, we would miss the main thing. And just in case you don't know what the main thing is, we're going into it right now, verse 13. He says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. Oh, we're right back where we started. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, and here's how you use your freedom, serve one another humbly in love. Serve one another in love. Verse 14, for, he's talking about the Old Testament here, the entire law, and this is so powerful, the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. What's he saying? He's saying, if you really want to look for this, I can take you back into the Old Testament and show you that this rule has been there all along. All along. The entire law is fulfilled with this one commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. By the way, it comes from the book of Leviticus. It was in scripture all along. It's like Paul's going, you know, the Jews had the magic all along. They, they had the insight. They had this kernel of truth that would one day be expanded to all generations everywhere. And they had it buried in the Old Testament. They had it all along. All right, here's, here's, here's the, the one part you're going to remember from tonight, okay? I'll bet Kathy next week you'll be able to tell me this almost word for word. Do y'all remember the movie The Wizard of Oz? Yes. Do you realize that you could have stopped that movie after 12 minutes and you would have had everything you needed? How long does that movie go? It's like two hours and 30 minutes, something like that. It's real long. Do you remember that? So I want you to imagine, if you could, that the entire movie only runs 12 minutes. You got a tornado scene, you know the cyclone, then you got Dorothy, Dorothy! You got NTM, NTM! She gets hit on the head, wakes up in the land of Oz, all those cool little people running around, then she takes the shoes off of the witch and puts them on her feet. Do you realize at that moment, she could have clicked her heels together three times, been back in Kansas, 12 minutes, movie's over, no commercials. <laughs> At the end of the movie, what do they tell her? Oh yeah, by the way, you've had the secret the whole time. You've been wearing the shoes. All you had to do was click three times. And so here's what Paul is saying. That's my sermon in a nutshell right there. He says, to my Jewish brothers and sisters whom I love, we had the secret the whole time. What is it? To love your neighbor as yourself. Here's what Jesus would say. Love God, love your neighbor. The rest is detail. Love God, love your neighbor. The rest is detail. The temple model says, hey God, how are we doing? Hey God, how are we doing? The Jesus model says, look around and then you'll know how you're doing. 
God says get things right with people because when things are right with people, things are right with us. And it's why he can say what he said in the second half of verse 6. Go ahead and put this back up there. Last part of verse 6. Go ahead and put that up there. That's it. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself in love. When we get this right, we will pray differently. We will see life in a completely different way. When we get this right, our religious experiences will be characterized more by freedom than anything else. And when we get this right, we will treat people better. When we get this right, we're not going to sit and shake our heads as we did last Wednesday when all that junk was going on on television and the whole world, I had people calling me saying, is this the end? Is, is Jesus coming back now? Is this the, the, the rapture? Is this is all this going on now? And I'm, I'm, wait, I'm, I'm just thinking, you missed it. What's the most important thing that we can do? Vote the right party. No. <laughs> the most important thing that we can do is learn to love other people. Can you imagine how different our communities would be if just the Christians decided? You know, there's really only one thing that matters. It's my faith expressing itself in love for other people. So crosswalk, what would it look like this week if with every interaction we have, with every conversation we have, every temptation that comes our way, what if we ask this question? What does love require of me? This will change your life. This will change everybody else's life around you. This is, by the way, this isn't new. This is how it's always supposed to be. And we're going to change because faith expressing itself in love is what's gonna set this church apart. Do you know why most churches can't do this? Because they can't get along with each other. I've been in church for all of my life. I have seen churches fight and struggle and scratch and claw and have power struggles and, have, and push people away and send people away, sometimes on purpose and sometimes not on purpose. And I've seen it, it just, we've got to get this right. So I want you to try it this week. This is your question for the week. What does love require of me? And then come back next week because I got a whole bunch more to say, okay? And no, there is no excuse for you becoming apoplectic this week. <laughs> Got it? All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for the word that you give us. Thank you for the truth. I know, Father, it may seem like we, had, we took a long way around the barn to get to where we had to go. But there's something that's got to change. And this could make the crosswalk, your church, this could make your church different. And I want to be that different. In the name of Jesus, we pray this. Amen. Amen.